All right, Jay, let me ask you, what is your favorite movie? What a weird way to introduce this episode of the podcast. Not to worry, old buddy, old pal, I have a sneaky suspicion that this conversation is scripted, so I have a feeling that'll lead us to where we need to go. Laughs nervously. But to answer your question, my favorite movie at the moment is The Big Short. You mean that movie about the 2008 financial crisis and one of the few movies Ryan Gosling was not sure in? Yes, Prakash. Unfortunately, that is the one I'm referring to. <laughs> Why do you love that movie so much? Well, because the movie was talking about the real world. The global financial crisis affected everybody, and the effects are still being felt today. But even though it affected everyone, at the time, most people didn't actually know why it was happening, including us. But everyday people played a lot more of a role in the crisis than they think they did, though. Well, you got your reasons, and I got mine. The 2008 financial crisis actually played a huge role in who I am today. It's what led me to getting my first job at 15, because I started realizing that money was playing a larger role in my life than my teenage self would have expected. But I didn't understand why the crisis was happening until late years later. And The Big Short did play a huge part in that. But not every event can be made into a movie seven years later, and by then it's usually too late. Because we all remember how many individuals purchased Bitcoin stock without understanding what cryptocurrency was. So then, how should we stay up to date or learn about these things as they happen? Because these things do affect our lives, whether or not we actually know about it. Business journalism, my friend. Business journalism. Well, then who better to discuss this with than Howard Green? Three-time best-selling author, former broadcaster enlist for 33 years, and founding anchor at Canada's Business News Network. I agree. Let's do some quick facts to prime people for today's conversation. Well, one of the things you'll hear us discuss today is BNN, the Business News Network, which Howard actually helped found and build, anchoring on the channel from 1999 to 2014. In 2018, it was acquired into the Bloomberg Media Group and is now known as BNN Bloomberg. Aw oh, yeah, corporate mergers. Wait, that's it? Those are really some quick facts. My name is Prakash. And my name is Ajay. And this is the Real Talk Roundtable. Welcome to the Real Talk Roundtable. Today with us we have Howard Green. Howard, thank you so much for joining us today. My pleasure. Howard Green is an author and moderator who's spent more than three decades in broadcasting. He's one of the founders and builders of Business News Network, or otherwise known as BNN in Canada, now BNN Bloomberg, where he anchored from the channel's first day in 1999 until the end of May 2014. Howard is best known for hosting BNN's flagship interview show, Headline with Howard Green, where he interviewed everyone from Alan Greenspan to Tony Blair to Sir Richard Branson, not to mention an endless number of North American CEOs, decision makers, and market players. Howard is also a prize-winning documentary maker. He directed, wrote, and co-produced the investigation of Swissair 111. And for his work on the film, Howard won the top television prize in Canada, the Gemini Award. Howard also moderates at conferences and consults to corporations, institutional investors, and educational institutions. From 2013 until 2016, he served on the board of directors of the Canadian Journalism Foundation. And Howard is currently a special advisor to the chairman of Dyslexia Canada. Howard, you're a journalist, a documentary filmmaker, and author. I assume we can expect a rap album from you soon? <laughs> <laughs> you know, I did that. I did that before it was like a thing. Before it was cool. Yeah, not an album, but I did actually rap on TV back in the, I don't know, probably 1985 when I was working on a kids' news show for CBC. It was called What's New, and it was an after-school thing. And uh, they put a beret on me, and... Uh, my my uh, my name was Howie G. I knew it. And you were <laughs> MC. <laughs> oh my guess. And it's somewhere in the CBC archive, film archives. So this footage. Yeah, yeah. They wrote a little rap, and I, I forget who 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 did it with me, but there were a couple of us. A anyway, so you know, you never know who you're with. <laughs> Apparently not. <laughs> and no word of a, no word of a lie, Howard. When we were planning that question. Um, we actually, we made that up. We thought, you know, Howie G would probably be a rap name if he did. And Howie G, behold. newest MC. So, Howard, we've given the audience a flavor of w some of what you've accomplished in your introduction. But before we jump into your career, could you tell us a bit about your background in, in your own words and how you got started in business journalism? In business journalism. Okay, so I, uh, well, let me back up a bit. I went to journalism school at Carleton in Ottawa and I did a minor in economics. And at that time, uh, there was very little focus on coverage of, journal, uh, of business in journalism. It was political journalism, it was foreign affairs, 
It was sports. It was the arts. So then what attracted you to journalism and economics as your major and minor? Well, journalism, I think, first of all, it was something that I could do that was different than being a doctor. My father was a doctor. His brother was a doctor. And I think uh, there was an expectation that I would be a doctor. And I actually was accepted to do um, uh, honors biochemistry pre-med at Queen's. But at the last minute, I bolted because I knew myself. I would be a terrible doctor. I mean, humanity has been saved by the fact that I was not a doctor. <laughs> uh, and, uh, but I was interested in current events. And uh, you know, one of my earliest memories is the Kennedy assassination. I was four years old, almost five. When, when President Kennedy was shot. And I remember my parents watching the coverage on a black and white television set. It was huge news. And it, 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 obviously, it's still something that's discussed uh, all these years later. Um, and then the period after that was, it was just a tumultuous period um, in North American history with the Vietnam War and other assassina assassinations in Canada. We were just kind of steeped in news. and and. So I went, uh, not really knowing what journalism school would be like. It wasn't a time when you went and did tours of a bunch of universities like kids do now. Right. You just kind of went. My sister had gone to Carleton, and I, so I went to Carleton. Uh, she didn't do journalism. But, uh, you know, I kind of fell in love with it. And uh, I, you know, was learning a skill while I was also getting an academic education. And um, I loved it. And you know, I worked at the TV station in Halifax, the private TV station, Summers. Started as a gopher, hanging lights, cleaning the weatherboard, and all that kind of stuff. And then I convinced the, exa the news director, who was a real tough character named Dick. Um, they always are, even yeah, movies. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and he had a nickname. I won't share it. But uh, anyway, um, uh, he was very good to me. And he let me stay for a week extra. I said, I work for nothing before I go back to school. He said, no, I'll pay you to take feeds and, and so forth, the news feeds and do odd jobs around the newsroom. And then he hired me back the following summer as a, you know, like a junior cub reporter. I was still at, I was between third and fourth year university. And that gave me great, gave me great experience. I was out shooting this and that and the other thing. And, and uh I did a bit of uh, part-time work on Parliament Hill my last year at university for them, uh, filling in for a guy. I mean, there I was, 21 years old, reporting from Parliament Hill. It was a joke, really. You know, what did I, I knew nothing. But there I was, standing there, you know, baby face, and, you know, in front of a camera. And uh, Not much has changed. Not much has changed. <laughs> <laughs> Checks in the mail. Uh, so anyway, uh, and then I got hired by CBC National News. When I, upon graduation for a training program, um, which was a blast. And I, I was in St. John's, and then I was in Goose Bay, Labrador. And um, then I moved to Toronto in 83, and for five years I worked on that kid show that I mentioned earlier where I rapped. And we did everything. I mean, we covered every issue that was on the national news, but we, we did it. Uh, we boiled it down for a youth audience. So and it was a huge challenge, and I learned a ton there because when you're working with a youth audience, you can't condescend, mm -hmm. yet you can't assume prior knowledge. So there's a very clear line that you have to stick to. And, you know, when you went to interview, I mean, we put kids, I mean, the adult news would do stories about a school. But they'd never interview the kids. They'd interview the parents or the principal. It's like kids see things too, and they have a point of view. And teenagers are very articulate in many cases and um, can express themselves. So we went to them, and we spoke to them. And I learned more from interviewing teenagers than perhaps anything I ever learned in journalism. I mean, I sat next to a, you know, a blind girl who explained to me how to use her Braille machine. You just, you talk to them. And, they, and then later when I had to interview all these CEOs or the 
former chairman of the Federal Reserve or, you know, Tony Blair, these people that you mentioned in the, in the intro, right. hey, you know, you're no big deal. I, t I, t <laughs> I t a, a, a little blind girl, you know, it was tougher to interview her than it is to interview you. You know, uh, so it put a lot of stuff in perspective. Now I'm exaggerating, but I think it, what it taught me is that you have to treat all people the same. And as long as you're curious, and as long as you don't condescend, uh, you can ask people almost anything as long as you do it in the right way. I mean, even if you, had, I had to ask a lot of CEOs, do you think you really should resign, you know, after what happened to this company? And, you, you know, you had to learn how to ask it in a respectful, uh, humanistic human way. But it was after that show, which was called What's New, um, that I ended up in business journalism because I didn't have a job. I left that show after five years in 1988, and I didn't want to go back to local television news. Uh, but uh, there was a business show on CBC, national business show called Venture. It was on for about 20 years. It was Sunday nights. It was a big show. It had a big audience, million, two million people, which is huge in television in Canada. I mean, now it's so fragmented. No, you know, nothing gets that, you know. Maybe Game of Thrones, yeah. which I've never seen, but I've heard a lot about. It's okay. It, it's a disappointing <laughs> ending. You didn't miss anything. But I'm doing all the talking. You guys got I, – I, I just keep blathering on here. I, but that's how I got to business, business journalism, 1988, covering it for venture. And then it built from there. Howard, I know you're very passionate about this, <laughs> but I gotta ask you a favor. I gotta ask you to stop smacking the table to make your point. <laughs> your point is heard, but it will also we love be the heard. Emotion. Hey, you're hitting your hand on the table. No, no, no. You see the soft, oh, okay. the soft landing. The soft, the soft yeah, landing is key. I know, I know. That's right? right. Soft landing. I should learn. How many decades have been in broadcasting? But you know, it's so funny because cameramen, camera women, used to get irritated with me because you know when you have two cameras shoot. Mm -hmm and they're behind you shooting the guest, and they're just over your shoulder, you're out of the shot, and I talk with my hands, as, oh. you, as you point out. Uh, the view. My, my hand would go in front of me, you stop putting your hand in front of the light, so today I stop hitting the table. So again, not much has changed. <laughs> <laughs> we love that you're comfortable, though. Still, yeah. still, giving, still giving the AV guys help. Okay, um, I'll sit and, on my hands. The, if you have to, that's what you gotta do. <laughs> Take a page out of those kids' books. Yeah. Um, so we understand how you got your start in business journalism, but we're going to ask you a very, what might seem to you a very simplistic question, but honestly one okay. that we even would like to have answered ourselves. What exactly is business journalism? Um, and in other words, why should the general public care? Like, what, what is different about it? Well, that's a very good question, and it's a question that I've often addressed when I've spoken to journalism students, because as I said earlier, a lot of them are afraid of numbers, think journalism or business journalism is boring they want to cover other things but you know it's telling people something journalism is really a very simple concept it's telling people something they didn't know and if you achieve that you've done it uh, and business journalism is you know an extension of that it's telling people about the business world or the economic world and what I try to impress upon students, and how I'll answer this, is that the world, you know, is, you know, imagine a barbell in a gym. Mm -hmm. you know, there's 50 pounds on the right, 50 pounds on the left. Not that I can lift that much, but, you know, on one side is politics and government. Right. And the other side is business. And at least in say, the Western world, the G7 countries, Western Europe, uh, North America, parts of, parts of Asia, um, Australia, you know, the, the typical capitalist countries. Um, and there's a constant balancing that goes on. Prior to the financial crisis of 2008, you had business that was very much in control of things and uh, screwed it up. 2008, 2009, government has to come in, bail out the automakers, lower interest rates to zero, flood the markets with liquidity so asset prices get pumped up again. So there's this constant calibration going on between um, 
government policymakers and and business people. And you know, if business people go too far, they get regulated. Like now, we're talking about well, should we regulate Facebook? Should we regulate Google? Um, and uh, that all you know, that's all coming back uh, potentially. I mean, it happened at the turn of the 20th century with um, uh, John D. Rockefeller, who owned everything. Standard Oil was broken up. In, that's where Exxon came from. Uh, there were railroads, there were steel mills, uh, everything. So yeah. Teddy Roosevelt, the president then, busted uh, up those uh, monopolies. Uh, and maybe we're gonna see that kind of thing again. I mean, that's the, the you know, the constant um, push and friction pull, guess, yeah. and push and pull between uh, public policy and and business finance and economic policy and it affects everybody it affects you know can you pay your mortgage uh, can you pay your car loan can you put your kids through school are you going to have enough money for your retirement and so what might seem boring to you as a prospective journalist is really important for people so then to the audience of the people that are reading business journalism? Is it the general public? Is it, it other be. business? It should be. So then how do you make business journalism interesting for the general public if they don't understand the ramifications of those big decisions on their lives? Well, again, another good question. And I used to address that question in my own head when I used to do the show at BNN. And I was always of the belief that we should not dumb things down. We should not just go for the lowest common denominator, which is kind of a, a bit of a cliche in, in journalism, you know, make it, you know, dumb it down, you know, so people can understand. Well, you know, people know things. And uh, my feeling was just tell it straight and tell it in such a way that, you know, look, if somebody mentions something like in, in an interview, a HELOC, for instance, Home Equity Line of Credit, and they just use the acronym. I would jump in and I would say, oh, you mean a Home Equity Line of Credit, for those in the audience who didn't know what a HELOC was. But what I would try to do is do the show so that a very wide band of people could get something out of it. So that if you're not a finance person, you're not an economist, but maybe you have, you know, you've got an RSP, you've got uh, an RESP for your kids, or you're, you know, a young person thinking about buying a house or, or whatever, or buying a stock. Uh, that you'll get something out of it too. But the interview would be done, or the discussion would take place in such a way that the CEO who was watching, or the finance minister who was watching, would get something out of it too. It's written on multiple levels, but written in a way that people can understand. You know, you've given us uh, a lot of reasons, even the, all of our listeners and the general public, a lot of reasons to listen. But if you could maybe crystallize in a few words to someone who maybe doesn't care right now or doesn't have the time to or hasn't necessarily been inclined to be interested in business journalism proper, what would you say to them to try and get them interested, to try and let them know why they should care? What's your pitch, I guess? Because it's about their lives. Even if they don't know it? Yeah. Right. Like, you know, do you have a job? Right. Then it's about your life. Because if you work for TD Bank, I mean, you never know when the bank's going to lay people off or hire more people or, you know, change its focus and get more into, I mean, obviously, I'm, I'm stating the obvious here, the banks have gotten more into technology in recent years, for right. instance. So, so, you know, it's just kind of important to know what's going on in the world. And it's part of what is going on in the world. It's part of your life, and, and if you don't really know what's going on in the world, you're not going to make good decisions. For your role as a business journalist, do you think your job is to tell the news as it is? Do you interpret the news to provide trends on what could be upcoming, or is it more just a factual basis of what's happening? First, I would say I'm not really a business journalist anymore. I left BNN five years ago, and I was, you know, in broadcasting and journalism for 33 years. I, I, I kind of separate the book period, which is my last five, seven years, from that, even though the skills that I use were, were skills I developed as a journalist. Um, but I would say that it's a combination of, of what you said, because you, 
yes, you report what you know to be the facts are, and you, uh, but you have to then ask questions based on those facts. Uh, you might um, draw conclusions based on those facts. I wasn't one to give my opinion when I did the show. I felt that I was, you know, I, I, I did. People, you know, there were some people who thought, oh, I know what Howard thinks by the way he asked that question. They had no idea what I was thinking. Right. You ask questions to get information. I would pay a lot less attention to the questions than I would the answers. That's what I would tell people. Uh, you know, so uh, they, they would think that they could detect your bias and so forth. And, you know, I, I mean, nobody knows what's going through your mind but yourself. I mean, you know, I don't know what's going through your head or your head right now. I mean, yeah. You're much less trying probably to probably thinking, geez, I wonder when this interview is going to end. <laughs> Not at all. <laughs> <laughs> we wouldn't ask you that, uh, to be here if that was the case. Not at all. And, and if, if anything, I would imagine instead of trying to give an opinion, your real motive would be try to coax an opinion out of whoever's in front of you. Well, yeah, get a but, view, uh, get an observation, get a, an emotional reaction. Uh, tell a story. I mean, you know, there's certain. E each situation is different. I mean, in a, in the span of thousands of interviews, each one would have a, a kind of a life of its own, and you'd be trying to um, uh, extract different things in, in in different situations. You know, with Alan Greenspan, for instance, who you mentioned in the, in the intro, the former chair of the Federal Reserve. Well, you know, did you have any? You know, uh, this was, when did I do that interview? 2012 or 2013, so it was about five years after the, four or five years after the implosion in the financial system, and he had stepped down as, uh, he'd left the position as chair of the Federal Reserve a year or two before, and Bernanke was chair, but he had been chair of the Federal Reserve for 19 years right. or something like that, multiple appointments, and I said to him, you know, did you, do you have any, I can't remember the exact words, but uh, do you wish you'd done ever anything different? Shook his head. That was unbelievable. Did, do you challenge that point when he just shakes his head? Yeah, yeah, sure. We did a whole segment about that. Um, but, uh, I mean, I, you know, that, that spoke volumes to me. I mean, how can you not uh, interpret something from that? Here's a guy who was probably the most important economic policy maker in the world, if not one of the most important people in the world, right. for close to 20 years, and within, you know, a year and a half, well, things started to go clafooey in 2007, actually, uh, in the summer of 2007. So that was a year or so, or a year and a half after he left the position. So, I mean, how could you not wonder, as a human being, could I have done anything different? Uh, that was astonishing to me. So, you know, you, it's just a simple question like that, uh, right. you know, extracts shake of the head, well, and it what starts planet a whole new are you on, buddy? It starts a whole new conversation. Right. You know, I want to just take you back quickly to that analogy you had about the barbell. But just in general, um, when it comes to journalism, some forms are somewhat as old as time. Political journalism, war journalism, right? These are understood and, and well-known forms of journalism. But you, how would you differentiate business journalism from other forms? What a lot it that newer. Makes it special? It's a, a lot, lot newer. newer. So then on that point... Yeah, and I, it's a good, I would give you a little fact there. Tell me. You know, the, the Globe and Mail, mm -hmm. Canada's national newspaper, the report on business section. Right. That started in 1963. So that's, you know, what is that, 56 years? Yeah. Right. So that's, you know, that's not that long no, ago. No, my parents' age. Right. Yeah. To, that, to that exact point, though, you, I know, I've actually heard you say in, in other instances that business journalism, specifically in Canada, is a bit of a newer phenomenon. How did it actually come to be? What, what was that catalyst? I guess, how did it grow? Well, I don't know what the... Um, the motivation was uh, at the Globe back in the early 1960s. I assume somebody thought to themselves, hey, 
we're not covering this part of the barbell. Was that the first instance still? Well, I think mo you know, most papers would have a business page, right. but it was the stock tables. Yeah. But somebody must have made a decision at the Globe that, hey, we can, we can um, we're in Toronto. This is the financial center. Or actually, Montreal was uh, the financial right. center yes. then. And <laughs> then in the early 70s, that changed. Yeah. But um, they must have thought, hey, we can make some money out of this. People want to know, and this is another aspect. You know, everything evolves, and, and uh, that evolved. But in broadcasting, nobody cared about covering business. You know, the National had a business reporter, you know, probably beginning in the uh, 80s, I guess. I'm just guessing at that. But right. that's when I became conscious of it. It was never played up. Uh, and CBC launched this business show that I'm t I talked about earlier, Venture, in 1985. And I went there in 88. And, and it was right, the timing was interesting because it coincided with boomers, baby boomers, reaching the point in their lives when they'd make their first investments, buying houses. Maybe they got laid off for the first time. There was a brutal recession in the early 1980s. Right, I was just going to ask you about that. I mean, we're coming off the oil crisis. You're getting back into a recessionary yeah. period. This horrible, horrible recession in 1982. Right. It, it coincided with the democratization of the stock market. So the timing was good. And then it evolved kind of into a mini institution in Canada. People would watch it Sunday nights. You know, the weekend's over, you're kind of getting torqued up for Monday morning, back at work, business show's not such a bad thing after the news on Mon on Sunday night. You need the water cooler talk. Pardon me? You need the water cooler talk. Yeah, water cooler talk. And people did talk about it. Right. If I could just jump forward a bit for a little, mm -hmm. for a little bit. Um, I know you said when it started, it was a bit wishy-washy, became a bit more established over time, then eventually became an actual institution, which is yeah. what we know today. What would you say about the current state, though? Current the, state of the what? The current state of business journalism in, in Canada. Canada. Shrunken. Shrunken. Yeah. Really? Why is yeah, that? Yeah, unfortunately, uh, as important as it is, and, and funnily enough, it's been, well, look, I, I think you have to go back to 2007. That's when the first iPhone came out. Was it 2007, 2008, somewhere Around in that time? Yeah. That changed everything. I mean, really, you know, Netscape changed everything in 1995 with the World Wide Web. And, you know, it was only a matter of time before traditional forms of transmitting information, like newspapers and television and radio, would be supplanted by others who, you know, knew how to devise groovy, funky new ways of doing things, you know, the Facebooks and the Googles and so forth. So, or the YouTubes, which I guess is part of Google. <laughs> um, but re things really changed in 2007 when the iPhone came along and, you know, you could do everything from one of these. I'm holding an iPhone here for those of you who can't see me. So the, the advertising market shifted from television to Facebook or Google. So traditional journalism has been squashed like a bug or the business model. If we're jumping forward, what do you see the future of journalism being? Do you think there's a resurgence or a different form in how people will get news, whether it be business or just politics? How does it, mm. how do you see that coming to be? Well, I think we're still in a state of flux I know outlets are still laying people off, traditional outlets, as they've tried to um, morph into more digital properties to keep up with the new world. But it's been very difficult. And we're in a very tricky time in the world with the rise of populism and uh, a lot of not nice things going on. And at the same time, you have journalism I'm not just talking about business journalism, now I'm talking about journalism more broadly, being diminished, being uh, shrinking, or you know, resources shrinking because of you know, what's happened to the business models, or frankly, disinterest from 
a lot of young people. I mean, I know a lot of young people just don't read the news, don't follow the news. Is it because it'll trust it? Well, I don't know. Uh, I think they maybe are overwhelmed and they uh, they think they're getting it when friends share stuff on Facebook. But <laughs> frankly, that's an echo chamber. Mm -hmm. You know, your friends are just sharing stuff that they think you'll like. Like-minded people. Or, or you'll press like on their thing and then nobody's sort of, or nobody. But, but uh, it seems to me uh, a few decades ago, we had the water cooler situation where, you know, there were only a few networks and you'd watch the news at night or you'd read the paper in the morning. People would talk, know about the same things, talk about the same things. Now everything's very fragmented. And it's good in certain ways because you, you learn things you wouldn't know otherwise and you connect with people in other ways. But, but journalism has become very fragmented. There are a few strong outlets still uh, that are that are doing very um, strong reporting, heavy lifting. But I think the demonization of media and the demonization of news by people like Donald Trump is bad. You've interviewed many prominent business leaders and executives. Mm -hmm. One thing that's important in kind of doing so is not just nagging them, but actually getting their trust. Yeah. How did you go about gaining their trust during an interview? And we're just asking for a friend. No. <laughs> <laughs> I think you, you, you know, you have to let people know that you're going to give them a fair shot, that you're, you're there to listen and to understand. You may challenge, but if you do challenge, you'll challenge in a respectful way. And um, yeah, I, I, I think that you have, to, you have to form a bond with people. Um, you have to, you know, I would go into the green room where people were made up for the show, you know, and I'd greet them. And sometimes, you know, if they weren't particularly public people, like I remember one guy was a, he was a noted brain surgeon and he was the CEO of a medical company, small medical company. And I went into the green room to see him and I said, you know, introduced myself. And he was kind of pale. And uh, he said to me, Howard, how does one get over one's nervousness? I don't think he'd ever been on TV before. And so I said to him, you know, um, doctor, I can't remember his name, I, uh, I'm just back from a week's holiday. I'm a little nervous myself. Am I going to be able to get back on the bike and do it again? And he, he totally relaxed because he, then he saw me as a human being. He didn't see me as like a television anchor you know, one sort of a one-dimensional cardboard figure, but as a human being. And, and we were going to have a human interaction. And, you know, he would never be a, you know, this incredible public speaker like Hunter Harrison was, but he made it through the interview fine. He, and, and he wrote me a beautiful letter afterwards thanking me for helping him get through it. So, uh, you know, it's those kinds of things. And, and um being a human being, and and um, so, you know, I think you you do have an impact, and and you have to take it seriously, and um, so uh, I don't like when people call it fake news. But if if nothing else, and irrespective of how people feel, even though you are sometimes trying to you know coax an emotional reaction out of people. Yeah, because it, emotions are human. Exactly. But and it, it tells you how somebody really feels exactly. or thinks about something. But whether they feel good or bad, mm -hmm. I think the, that is essentially the importance of journalism is that you ask those questions mm -hmm. in the most objective way possible right. for, and most importantly, the right reasons. And, I mean, that's what we've tried to do here today. And you've given us some very straightforward and honest answers. But we really just want to thank you for taking that time, walking us through why journalism is important, why specifically business journalism is probably matters to a lot more people than they think it might. Um, and it's really impressed upon us a, a deeper understanding. And I'm glad that you've referenced some older stories and some older folks that, like you said, some of whom we've even passed on. It's important you keep that memory alive. And again, another important reason that journalism is a force that we should really try to preserve. I mean, that's, I guess, one of the underpinnings of freedom of the press. Yeah, and one of the underpinnings of democracy. Exactly. Yeah. History is where we come from, and I think journalism 
plays its role in documenting that. So we want to thank you for documenting that. And one thing I want to kind of also thank you for is you never left your journalistic personality behind. You noticed when you told, we noticed when we told your stories, you would say things like Alan Greenspan and then tell us his role and uh, you would do that with everything. So bread in the bone. Yeah. <laughs> we learned. Old a, habits die hard. Hey, exactly. we, we learned a lot. So we really do appreciate your time and thank you so much for being on Thanks, this episode. Guys. Appreciate you having me. Pleasure. You know what? I can see why Howard would say that people may not engage with business journalism anymore because they're overwhelmed with the information they get every day. A lot of folks may feel that the world has gone sadder. Because it has. But I'd actually argue that it's not that the world has gone darker, but we're just seeing more and more of it because we're all connected closer than ever before, thanks to technology. You are right, Prakash, as you always are. Yep. Wow, this really is scripted, isn't it? The world is becoming more and more integrated every day, though, and business is actually a big part of that. Speaking of which, Howard even brings up the 2008 crisis when he talked about Alan Greenspan's role in it. So it looks like even the three of us are connected in recognizing how business affects the lives of millions, if not billions. And I know it's easy for people to ignore business journalism, but it truly does give you an understanding on why the world is the way it is, which is really the first step for those that either want to change it or just understand it. All right, I'll be today's broken record. Don't forget to follow our social media pages on Twitter, Facebook, and Instagram for updates. Feel free to share your comments with us, and if there are any future topics you'd like us to explore, please let us know. Finally, if you liked what we discussed today, feel free to share it with your friends and family. We really do appreciate your support. Thanks for listening, and we hope you'll join us on the next episode of The Real Talk Roundtable. Thank you.